break. Really enjoyed that last panel. Um, we are coming to the end of our symposium, and I am joined by a really special person who I have been getting to know a little bit over here, Zoom, as we've done some prep calls, and I am really excited for him joining us today and the conversation that we're about to have here for the next about 45 minutes. Um, so it's my great pleasure today to have Imran Ahmed joining me. He is the CEO of the Center for County Center for Countering Digital Hate. Um, he's the founding CEO of this organization um, and is definitely recognized as a world leader on the social and psychological dynamics of social media, as well as what goes wrong in those spaces. Um, he is regularly featured in the news media. He spent a lot of time thinking about this issue, everything from identity-based hate to misinformation, conspiracy theories, radicalization, extremism. Um, he's based in DC, right, Imran? That's right. Yeah, but you'll hear, you'll notice an accent. Uh, he's from the UK, um, and he definitely spends a lot of time thinking about both the UK and the US, as well as globally, some of these challenges that we have. Um, so I'm excited. Thank you for joining us today. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm I'm really excited about this, and it's just it's a really interesting audience to be speaking to. Um, it is an interesting audience. They've had great questions throughout the day, um, and I'm sure they're going to have some great more for you as we go throughout. But Imran, why don't you just share a little bit with our audience about the center uh, that you founded and the work that you do and, and how does it relate? Like what's really, what's special about the work that you all do? Well, look, I mean, first of all, thank you for inviting me to speak. And thanks to those people who've stuck around to hear me speak. Um, the Center for Countering Digital Hate was set up around six uh, years ago. It was set up in the wake of a series of um, of real life earthquakes in our societies. And for me, at the time I was in the United Kingdom in 2015, 2016, and we had two things happen politically which had never happened before. One was this sudden, sudden resurgence of anti Semitism into British politics, which was really shocking and, and scary uh, for me. Uh, I, at the time, was working in the UK Parliament and, and remember sort of getting thousands of uh, pretty wild-eyed conspiracist uh, emails with anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. And the second was the resurgence of uh, anti-Muslim and anti-Black hatred around the EU referendum, the referendum in the UK as to whether or not to leave the European Union. And people forget, but in that moment, uh, there were all sorts of crazy conspiracy theories flying around, including one about how the election was being rigged uh, so, that the, so that we wouldn't leave the European Union. Uh, you know, the, the sort of rumor that might seem familiar to some people now uh, in the United States. And across the pond in the United States, things were happening as well. We saw a resurgence of an ancient kind of hatred. Um, you, you will all remember the marches who chanted the Jews will not replace us. Um, but there were other things happening as well. And we saw a fundamental shift occurring in in our societies. And we realized that it wasn't about left or right or UK or US. It was something that was happening globally. There was a fundamental shift in the way that we manufacture uh, our understanding as a society of facts, of um, our values of our social mores, our attitudes, our behaviors, what is acceptable, what isn't. And that was being driven by the fact that we were using social media increasingly to, 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 to negotiate those values, those social mores, the corpus of knowledge that we believe comprises facts. You know, th th this is a fundamental shift that's happened. It's happened in politics, it's happened in commerce, it's happened in uh, mental health in young people's experience of the world around them. And of course, that fundamental shift, that technology shift in how we communicate as a species is happening in science because 4.5 billion people now use social media. And that is, you know, we, we are sort of, it's not just about the scale, it's also about the economics of communication. At a really simple level, every additional message to every additional person on social media has zero marginal cost, it has a cost of zero. So you can send a message to 10 million people versus one person, and you can send 10 million messages versus one message, and it costs exactly the same, zero in cents and dollars. And that is, 
that's the nuclear bomb. That's the creation of potentially unlimited amounts of communications from virtually nothing. And and so, if okay. we are in, sorry, and, and if we are in that nuclear age of communications, then it's time for us to start understanding well, what does that mean for every single institution in society? Because th those economics having shifted so drastically, they are inevitably going to touch everything we do. So what do we, so, so let's, let's just go there, right? So what does this mean for institutions, right? We are seeing, we've spent a lot of time talking today about trust. We've spent a lot of time talking today about declining trust across different institutions, whether that's the media or the government or, you know, scientists at times. We've seen data where we saw, you know, an uptick increase of specific scientists during COVID, right? And we, we start to see that waning at times. So, you know, we're in this ecosystem, as you are talking about, where, you know, the cost of sharing information is just minimal to none and you can reach so many people and it is having absolutely detrimental impact. So what does that look like through your lens of the impact you're seeing on different institutions? What does that look like? And then I want to get to what can we maybe think about correcting some of this? What are some roles that we can do to build that trust? So let me start sort of slightly obliquely that that one of the things that the CCDH has done is in the past year and a half, uh, in, a, in around March 2020, we realized that COVID was going to be the biggest threat to human life uh, on the planet and that we had to, we had to deal with it fast, um, in particular, the misinformation flowing around it. So I retasked all of our staff and teams to look specifically at COVID disinformation. Now, we'd already done some work on anti-vaxxers and uh, for various institutions. And, and personally speaking, in 1998, when, the, when that famous paper in The Lancet came out, um, with, which falsely posited a link between MMR and autism, I was actually at UCL Medical School up the road from, uh, fr from um, uh, Andrew Wakefield at the time. Uh, so I remember it really distinctly. And so th that battle with um, misinformation around vaccines in particular feels incredibly familiar to me and, and almost like the story of my adult life. Um, so we quickly retasked and tried to study those anti-vaxxers. We knew that they saw COVID as an opportunity to grow their to grow their markets because they are fundamentally economically motivated, that they want to persuade people not to trust doctors and to trust them instead so they can sell them false cures, um, books, uh, access to websites, access to um, their email platforms, which gives them data, which they then can monetize in other ways. And we, 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 we actually infiltrated a number of their conferences and meetings where we, 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 we just listened and recorded them talking about how they were going to take advantage of this crisis. So they gave us the answer and in, in doing so gave us a much, much more, uh, a much broader understanding as well of the battle that we're in. They said that their battle is to persuade us of three things. Number one, COVID isn't that dangerous. Number two, vaccines are unsafe. Number three, you can't trust doctors or medical professionals. And for them, everything leads up to number three, that they know the biggest barrier to them succeeding is the trust that people have in physicians and in scientists. Scientists are still among the most trusted people in America. So they enjoy higher levels of trust with the general public than the military. You want to, I, over 80% of people say that they trust fairly or very much so medical scientists. Compare that to politicians, where it's around the 30% mark. Journalists, 30 to 40. So it is one of the, it, it, the medical science is one of the most trusted institutions in America today. And they saw their job as replacing that authority, of undermining that authority, what's called epistemic authority. And it's an epistemic battle that we're in. It's about who has the right to convey knowledge, who has authority, who is able to help you understand the world around you. And you're damn right that this is a battle that's being done in terms of we have to bolster the institutions that we already have 
which convey authority and information and facts and trusted knowledge. And, and at the same time, there is also a job to be done to, to help to expose those people who seek to undermine the, the role of science those that spread misinformation and lies and to understand why they're doing that. And CCDH very much sees its role as, as being in the latter. Like we have exposed the economic motivations behind the anti-vaccine industry, those people who seek to spread misinformation and lies about vaccines and undermine faith in doctors. But there have been, a, you know, there have been serial institutional failures over time by medical authorities, by doctors. I mean, I gave a speech recently to the Federation of State Medical Boards and reminded them that a, a slew of, whether it's the opi op opioid crisis or NASA or other, other real uh, crises in trust in the medical profession, that, that those institutions have in the past failed. And unfortunately, social media has presented a route for people who want to undermine that trust to be even more effective and more loud and more visible than ever before at doing so. So what does that mean? It means that those institutions that do have, that do base themselves on science, that command authority among the public, they will have to double down on ensuring that what they do is protect their own integrity and convey their integrity and morality through everything they do. This is a, a battle for who has the right to persuade people. And I'll tell you why that battle matters. That battle matters because in the last two years, every single time someone has not taken the advice that they should have from a, from a medicine, from a, from a medic or a, or a scientist or the CDC or any other public health authority, underpinning that decision has been, to, to an extent, the loss of faith in institutions because of their failure to, to act in a, in a way which demonstrates the highest possible standards of integrity. I, I appreciate that. I want to actually pick up a couple things you said there. We can break this apart, but because of the work that you do is understanding that why a little bit, right? And you mentioned the economic incentives and motivations in particular around some of the anti-vaccine. You know, there's political and then there's chaos. There's a lot of other bad intentions and actors out there. What are you seeing in your research when it comes to some of the why? And then I'd love for you to also maybe talk a little bit about what are you seeing the strategies that they're using to divide and to create um, create those campaigns? So the why and then what, let our audience know, what are the strategies that you've uncovered? So, I, I mean, I think right now we're in a position where we, we are in a, a very advanced stage of, of this, of this the, the particular debate over vaccines where you, you now, it's not just the people who spread misinformation because they're economically motivated to build their base. So I mean, if you take the anti-vax industry, they have around 60 million followers in the US and UK in total. So across a population of 300, uh, of around 420 million combined, 60 million people are following one of these, one of these bad actors. Um, and that means that they're getting a constant slew of propaganda. Um, you ignore the fact that the disinformation doesn't. So we found that 12 individuals produce the content that comprise that. So very often when people are, 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 are spreading misinformation, they're not spreading their own personal opinions. They're highlighting an opinion from someone else. So I, it's not people tend not to say, I think X. They say, look at this, which says X. And what we find is that the producers of that misinformation, there are there are super producers and those super producers, 12 of them are responsible for the content that comprises 65 percent of all shares of misinformation on social media platforms. And that was our report, the disinformation dozen, these 12 identifiable bad actors who are on all social media platforms. They're incredibly effective at, um, at using clickbait, at using other techniques at using the dynamics that work on social media. And social media is not a level playing field. Facts don't do as well as misinformation on social media. And there is a quantifiable difference in how effective, in how effective facts are versus misinformation. Misinformation is six times more likely to be spread, to be seen than, than good information. And there's, there's research into that. I can explain in detail why that's true on an engagement-based platform 
emotion and surprise and even our instincts to correct wrong information can the, the platforms don't care what that engagement is whether it's people saying this is nonsense or that people saying i agree and so whereas the cdc no one really no one no one engages with the cdc's feed and so it doesn't do that well algorithmically misinformation does incredibly well algorithmically so these people know how to game that system to work for them so those bad actors are primarily economically motivated and um that they're, they're trying to sell their own false cures one of them for example suggests that you should nebulize hydrogen peroxide and he's got a book that he can sell you that explains to you how you can do that one of them suggests that you can buy his supplements um on and his supplements are available on on a branded amazon web store um or they suggest that you can buy their books etc we've now got the instrumentalized so this they've built a sufficiently large base of people that believe them that there are now political forces and news for, and, and news organizations that seek to to access that market too they're thinking well it's a few million people that's a that's a decent sized market if we can if we can say to them hey we 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 actually believe you that these people will then go to bat for us they'll watch our shows they might even vote for us in an election and so what you're seeing is the instrumentalization of misinformation by political actors that them stepping into the world of science to say well actually we're with you on that so i think that we're at a particularly drastically bad state when it comes to vaccine misinformation in particular that that the, that that misinformation has now become a form of identity and your whether or not you believe in it or not has become a way of deciding but you know politicians are are suggesting that it's a way of deciding whether or not you're with them or against them um it is it's it's a it's a really really bad state of affairs that whether or not you will performatively agree with a lie defines whether or not you are in the tribe or out the tribe and um i'm afraid that the, that that is the result of misinformation which has flown unfettered over the entire period of of this of this pandemic in a moment and you know there's a reason why misinformation does really well in a pandemic conspiracy theories do really well in a pandemic well there's there's two big reasons one is that um that conspiracism is driven by epistemic uncertainty and anxiety so when people don't just not know the truth but they also don't know how to find the truth they are much more likely to reach for a conspiracy theory and conspiracy theories are very so that so that there is there is a that, that you're driven to conspiracism by epistemic anxiety but the problem is conspiracy conspiracy theories don't ever fill that epistemic anxiety think of epistemic anxiety as a desperate yearning for certainty and i mean if you haven't felt that in the last year and a half i <laughs> i don't know how because i have had days and months when i've just sat there going Christ, what the hell's going on like i'm this has been terrifying and of course if someone comes to you with a theory that helps to explain it you might you might just hold on to it just because you need some form of certainty but it never fills it because conspiracy theories fundamentally at their core are not based on a kernel of truth they're based on a lie they're based on a leap of faith and that you believe this and suddenly you will feel better and a leap of faith can never ever fill that desperate yearning for facts so people look for more and more conspiracy theories they rabbit hole and there is a second you know that the, i've talked about both the the economic incentives to 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 the producers of misinformation to those that instrumentalize the information there is a third economic actor involved social media companies because they themselves know that conspiracy theories are sticky and addictive and keep people on platform because where do you go to look for more conspiracy theories their platforms you don't find them in speeches like this you don't find them in the newspaper very often you don't find them in a lot of places you find a a glut of conspiracism on social media platforms and they found that content to be sticky and so they have literally over this over this over this crisis done the least possible to remove that misinformation when they find it and worse still i think our single most important report malgorithm was a study that that looked at what do the so what do the algorithms promote in the midst of a pandemic and what we found was that we found the algorithm on instagram which is the same algorithm that underpins facebook 
actually recommending conspiracism to people as recommended posts. So if you followed wellness, it would give you anti-vax conspiracies. If you followed anti-vax conspiracies, it would give you anti-Semitism and QAnon. If you followed anti-Semitic or QAnon accounts, it would give you anti-vax and COVID theories. So we have found a we found a deepening and broadening of effect of conspiracisms and extremisms driven by the algorithm's logic, because there is a third person making money out of this. You've got the bad act or, or profiting economically or politically is the term I always use. You've got the bad actors themselves, the anti-vaxxers. You've got the politicians and news organizations that have sought to exploit the audiences. And the third is the social media companies, which God knows don't need the money. You know, Mark Zuckerberg's worth $100 billion and yet have nevertheless sought to profit from misinformation over this over this pandemic. Can you talk a little bit about social media? Because you and I really, right before we came on stage, I, I brought it up that there was, you know, Facebook now meta, you know, just had a, an article in the Washington Post literally an hour or so ago about them taking down um, a global disinformation networks tied to, you know, immigration, tied to Hamas, tied to, you know, Chinese state groups. Um, and you would share some interesting um, thoughts with me. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, like you're talking about these algorithms and the platforms and social media and their slowness. I don't know. I don't know the right word, right? In actually taking off some of this misinformation. I, I just feel like it's been this really long, slow process and uphill battle. You know, we talked a lot about First Amendment rights and other things earlier um, in free speech earlier in today. So what are some of your thoughts on the social media platforms and their role in actually trying to tackle misinformation, disinformation, conspiracy theories, et cetera, propaganda? Sure. I mean, th this is a, an incredibly dense and, and interesting area. Like the, the philosophical and jurisprudential questions of First Amendment protections of speech on a social media platform are are really, really interesting. But I mean, I can tell you where the courts are right now on that in a moment. But I mean, at a, at a really simple level, social media companies are private platforms which have rules. They have community standards that we all sign up to. And those community standards say that you can't be racist, you can't be misogynist, you can't be homophobic, you can't spread misinformation about vaccines that might lead to human harm. You can't do a whole bunch of things. And yet the enforcement simply isn't there. I mean, you'd have to be incredibly naive to pretend that like they're doing a good job on it. And the truth is that you want to go on social media platforms and find brutal racism, you'll find it immediately. You want to find uh, misogyny and uh, hatred of women, of gay people, you'll find it very fast, as you will anti-vaccine misinformation. So keeping in mind that social media platforms outright ban anti-vaccine lies, so I'm, I'm not saying that there is that they're arbiters of truth. I'm just saying that there are clearly lies about vaccines and, and, and misinformation. They, they fail to clean that up and, and, and enforce their own rules. Then they have done a pretty bad job at it today. And most of their activity to enforce their rules is performative, performative for the headlines that it generates. So if you take, for example, the disinformation Delta, a piece of research which has been verified, corroborated, it was the Surgeon General cited it in his advisory on disinformation. President Biden used it when he accused Facebook of being killers. He says they're hosting these 12 people who produce 65% of the misinformation. Do something about it. They're breaking the rules. Get rid of them if you, if you guys want to do something. I can tell you that still today, they have only taken down 50% of their accounts. And these are people who serially post misinformation, telling people to inhale bleach, telling people that they shouldn't trust doctors, telling people that they that COVID isn't dangerous and isn't, isn't killing people, um, which is lies. I mean, even now, misrepresenting the number of people who have taken vaccines, over 7 billion doses of vaccines have been given. 3.3 billion people are fully vaccinated in the world, about 42% of the entire human population and 5 million people are dead. Those to me are the core statistics about the vaccine program, that millions are dead because of COVID, billions are vaccinated. And how many reports have you seen of actual negative consequences related to the vaccine versus to COVID? And of course, in, in, in reality, there's very, you know, that, that, there, that there are of course millions dead, there are no dead of, of the vaccine. And yet at the same time, if you went on social media platforms, you'd believe that to be 
untrue you'd, you there'd be much more of a that you'd be seeing a lot more of the information of misinformation about the the, the number of people taking the vaccines and the number of people dead because of vaccines so we, we we would argue they've done a pretty bad job on it and the truth is that they don't have to do a very bad job on it there is no legal obligation on them to keep someone on their platform so in the few instances where they have taken people off the platform this is what's really interesting so in public i remember when dr joe mccullough when we identified him as one of our disinformation doesn't he tweeted something about he did a, a he did a, a gif of obi-wan kenobi saying if you strike me down I'll, you'll i'll be oh is it darth vader i don't know it's one of the guys from star wars if you strike me down i'll become more powerful than ever before and you know so, so sort of saying like deplatforming actually helps us it brings more attention to me and at the same time facebook were, were warning that that there is there could potentially be first amendment violations so we track the litigation by bad actors when they're deplatformed by facebook and here's where it gets really interesting when dell big tree a big producer of misinformation about vaccines was deplatformed by facebook he sued them and he said you've broken my first amendment rights facebook turned around and said that's nonsense you don't have a first amendment right to decide what's on our platform we are protected by the first amendment and we have other legislation as well which makes it clear that we can decide what is on our platform because we're a publisher we own facebook.com and we don't want to have you on it so go away the second thing they argued was that whereas in public they all say if you deplatform us we'll go somewhere else we'll become even stronger in their litigation because they have to prove a tort they have to prove damage done to them they make it clear how much economic damage is done and what they say is really interesting they say we lose data and that data is valuable so we lose lists of people that have swallowed our nonsense that we can then market to and we economically utilize those lists to make money and there in those lawsuits is laid bare the truth about social media deplatforming of bad actors a it hurts those bad actors really severely because they treat this as an economic game and the second is it's not the platforms that have to abide by the first amendment rights to allow bad actors onto their platform it's the platforms who are protected by the first amendment from being forced to put someone else on the put those people on their platform because as they correctly argue think of it in the negative are you saying that facebook is has absolutely legally has to allow people to be racist to spread lies to do whatever they want on their corporate website because that's nonsense that's that's utter insanity so let's let's go into that a little bit more about courts and policy and regulation um you know where is this going to fall right like the we we were talking a little bit about the role of the courts earlier today um you know, you're mentioning it right now. Um, what does that regulatory policy framework look like? What what is what would be some of your wishes, perhaps? So, I, I am I, I'm a I, I, I'm someone who is politically small L liberal uh, in that I don't believe in the state uh, jumping all over our right to speak. Um, I think people should be allowed to think whatever the hell they want and. Um, and, and a robust debate is a really, really important thing in our society. The ability of people not to live with in fear of the government de government deciding what they're able to think or say. Um, and so I'm really anti content moderation. I'm really, you know, some European countries are really into defining what speech is allowed online. Germany, for example, has the Net DG, which says that um spreading holocaust denial in germany is a criminal act and doing it on social media platforms facebook can be fined for it i think that's deeply problematic and so what what we have advocated is a global framework a transnational framework that countries can sign up to which um combines two key things first of all transparency so my argument has always been with social media platforms you need to understand how it is that they operate 98% of Meta's revenue, Facebook's revenue, comes from advertising. The only thing that they want to do is keep you on the platform. Because if you're on the platform, you, you, you keep scrolling down, you'll keep consuming ads. And so 
the idea that this this is a platform that's about free speech or anything else is kind of nonsense really isn't it it's just it's just a bit bizarre to claim that this is a free speech platform when it's clearly an advertising platform it's also really bizarre to pretend that we're the customers of facebook you absolutely are not do you know that that if you use something for free you typically are the product you're not <laughs> the customer and so how all those platforms work are they keep you on platform they take your data and they sell it to someone else and i mean the funny thing is that we actually advertise on facebook we we we, we find it we we do it for very naughty reasons we actually advertise to facebook employees urging them to whistleblow on their own company uh which i think is one of the funniest things that my team's ever pulled off but the granularity of data that we have about where people are being able to target them you can't actually target facebook employees by their employer on facebook but we can target menlo park which is their headquarters geofence it and then have people with an advanced degree in engineering and we can get to all engineers that work at facebook really easily if you had any idea that we can even target people that express liberal views that work in menlo park so we can give them a, a liberal message we can target people with conservative views we can target people who who are uh, from an uh, from, from a minor who are min, min, uh, from a m minority um so we can give them a targeted message that the amount of data we hand over to those companies is immense and so we've always argued that instead of trying to um transform the content on those websites help people understand why that content is there so we want transparency of the algorithms that decide what content wins and what content loses and that means allowing people to understand how the content works what what what, what is it that 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 how is the that the playing field tilted and why is it tilted that way the second thing is enforcement so people are taken off the platform every day and people are not taken off the platform despite report you know people reporting them and saying that they are spreading misinformation or lies so in our experience um if you report misinformation to the platforms only in about 1 in 10 of uh, of those instances do they take any action whatsoever despite having rules of taking down this information so we'd like to have transparency of enforcement if you take someone's content down tell them why what rule did they break so which of your stated rules do they break and how do you consider them to have broken it and if you choose not to respond to someone's complaint tell them what rule did you assess it against and why did you not do anything the third thing we want to have transparency of is the economics and it's the economics that's key to this if you go on facebook do you have any idea why those ads are served to you you absolutely most of the time you really don't what we've what we are absolutely clear on is that if people understood what data they hand over to facebook and twitter and tiktok and other companies how that data is then used by those companies so they sell it to other companies and that's used to target them that it would change the way that they perceive the relationship they have to that platform so just imagine the next time you click on an ad that goes to you it says we used this data and you were able to see what it was that they were using which doesn't just include your demographics it also includes what things you look at how long you spend watching a video they are capturing data constantly on you segmenting you putting you into models trying to understand you so they can i'm not trying to understand you because they want to be better friends to you because they want to be better at helping other people to sell to you and then understanding how you were then targeted subsequently this is about changing perceptions of social media and 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 really washing away this idea that these are free speech platforms they really are not they're advertising platforms that are being used by some people in a way that simulates a debate but really isn't about a debate they don't want a debate they want you to argue and that's different to having a debate because arguments are emotional and arguments keep you on platform debates tend not to and the final thing we want are mechanisms for accountability so when the platforms go wrong and when they are for example when they when the, the the outcomes of their algorithms are harmful to society the the outcomes of their business is harmful to society we want a way of of fixing those and you know every industry produces harm 
it's not about i'm not saying social media is all terrible it is absolutely amazing so i live in washington dc i i actually got married a few weeks ago um you know where did i go to post the pictures for my family who are in manchester in england and couldn't be there to see social media where did i go and over the last year and a half when i've been away from my friends for because i moved to the states in july 2020 how have i um been vulnerable how have i felt love and sucker and friendship and empathy, social media. I mean, these are amazing platforms. How do I communicate with people from all over the world? How do I get the message out? Social media, of course, this is, these are fantastic platforms, but it creates some harms as well. Every industry does it. Think about hydrocarbons, uh, what they have allowed us to do as a society, the evolution in our societies, and at the same time, the harm of climate change. Well, of course, look, there are harms, and that's when you impose costs for the negative externalities in the economics, for, for the, the negative consequences of economically productive behavior. And that way you start to disincent disincentivize their production because social media companies could do something about it. But at the moment, under US law, and this is completely bizarre, there is a weird US law, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act 1996, which was passed before social media even existed, but profoundly affects social media. It says that no internet platform can ever be held liable for any harm created by, created, which is the result of a third party acting on their platform, which is bananas in the social media age. And yet, in the 25 intervening years has not been amended really, apart from a tiny bit to deal with child sexual exploitation. And there's a whole slew of bills that are coming up now in the United States. Many other countries are, are already legislating, which seek to both create transparency and accountability. So at the very least, we know what are the terms on which we are having this debate and why is it, what are the economic incentives for destroying trust in the medical profession and science? Yeah, uh, I will say we chatted a little bit today about emotions for sure, right? These emotions are great ways, like you shared, to connect, right? And and at the same time, it's also where there's opportunity for bad actors. Um, I want to take you in one final direction here before we kind of try to wrap up your conversation. This has been awesome. Congrats on getting married. Um, but you had said something earlier, um, which I, I'm, I'm hoping maybe there's some positive and hope, some hopeful thoughts that you have to build on this about the idea of, you know, it was science and it was scientific institutions and the idea of protecting and owning that integrity and morality. Um, you know, and then we've alluded to when there's uncertainty, particularly perhaps around COVID as we've experienced, um, you know, science is this process. It takes time to unfold and to increase our knowledge of something. And when there's uncertainty, while that works well for the science world and the scientific thinking and everything, like you said, that also presents potentially some bad opportunities for conspiracy theories to grow in that space of uncertainty. So how do we, what are your thoughts on the future? You know, this is, we are science and policy, you know that we, and I appreciate you bringing a lot of science angles to some of the work that you do, even though it's much broader than that. So when we want science to maintain that integrity and that morality and to be that, that guiding force of helping us think critically about facts and our state of knowledge and understanding these challenges, where do you, what, what should we be doing when there's that uncertainty, right? And there's that vacancy, what, what can scientific institutions and other trusted institutions who are trying to push out factual information, how can they fill that when there is uncertainty? So, I mean, yeah, th that question of, of maintaining the integrity of, 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 um, of institutions is vital. And that's why renewal and why, you know, new leaders coming forwards and the next generation of leaders are understanding the battles they're in and understanding the centrality, the urgency, uh, and the human cost of a failure to act in a way that shows the highest levels of probity and integrity is vital. But this is a different, you know, it's not just about the normal levels of integrity. This is a this is a, a this is a sea change, and the salience of integrity and perceived integrity 
has changed remarkably. First of all, because you're going to be under assault from people who are able to spread lies and misinformation really easily and actually are given the advantage. So we do actually need to win the systemic battles. Like you can't win when the playing field is so badly tilted against you. But let's just assume that everything works at the same time and that we have systemic change, we have, we can persuade, we can do damage to the bad actors. How do good actors have to behave? I remember speaking to Bobby Shriver, who's JFK's nephew, and I was, we were talking about specifically this battle of how institutions maintain their integrity. And I, I, I told him my 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 metaphor of the of the nuclear age of communications, and he just incredibly it's one of the most thrilling conversations I've ever had. But he he talked about his uncle about John John F Kennedy in the bunker, you know, in the Cuban Missile Crisis, and getting advice from this admiral and that admiral and this general about what to do. And he realized in that moment that all the advice, all the old ways of thinking had weren't effective in the nuclear age, that you had to reconstitute your understanding of what it means to be a leader in that moment, of what it means to be an effective strategist and tactician, of what it means to be an effective communicator. And he decided to go his own way. And I think that we are in one of those moments. This is going to require all of us to step up our game. It is a different battle. The old ways, the old ways of trying to maintain it, the, you know, of trying to um, think about integrity have changed. It's not just based on the relationships that we each have individually. It's also about our ability to collectively enforce and and, and observe to each other those the, the the sort of the precepts of our integrity. So whistleblowing, honesty, and transparency with each other, being able to speak truth to power, being able to speak truth to each other, challenging each other as communicators to show the highest levels of integrity. They matter more than ever before, because unless people can see that debate occurring and can see that we are behaving in a way that is honest and transparent, I don't think we're going to be able to win this battle. But I genuinely believe that the one group of people that get this better than anyone else are the generation that have grown up in, in this particular social media age understanding the nature of epistemic authority and how fragile it can be um, and that those communicators coming through I, I am incredibly excited to see the direction and the leadership they establish because I think it will be more sensitive more intelligent more vulnerable more honest a vulner you know the vulnerability of, of admitting the limitations of the scientific method in a moment of great anxiety in a moment when people are desperate for answers, for science to be able to say, we don't know yet, we're going to get there, but it'll take us time and let's ex let us explain to you why. Not just trust us, we're the scientists, but hold on a second and breathe, folks. This is going to take, this is going to take a minute. <laughs> and it will require us to rethink how we communicate and how we are able to carry the trust of others. I am absolutely certain that will meet that, that that need because it is urgent, but it is predictable, it is quantifiable. And I think if if ever we, we, we thought, you know, it, one of the things that I was very aware of early on dealing with very, very senior folks uh, throughout government and international government was they didn't even realize they were in a fight. I mean, in October 2020, someone from one of those big Bretton Woods institutions called me and asked me, do you know anything about anti-vaxxers? And I thought, uh oh, I thought you I thought you were the grown ups. <laughs> so we were in trouble. Um, and they just spent billions on Kovax. And, you know, I, 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 I think that they didn't even realize they were in a battle. I think that this that that after 2020 and 2021, it's not just the young folks, it's everyone. We now know we're in a fight. And when you're in a fight, Sometimes it changes the way that you behave. So let's be ready to let's be ready for, for for this moment that's ahead of us, and let's be ready to show the integrity, the vulnerability, the honesty, the transparency, and the accuracy that's needed to be effective. Well said.
and the humility. We've, we've brought that up today too, right? Um, when you're not right and you've made mistakes, own that and grow from that. And Ron, that was, that was a wonderful way to kind of end today's session. This was an awesome conversation. I thoroughly enjoyed it. We could have probably spent another couple hours just, just talking. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for all the work that you're doing um, at the Center for Counting Digital Hate. Um, it was an absolute pleasure. Thank you for being here today. Thank you so much and good luck to all of you.